Hello, good afternoon and good morning. My name is Eric Eisenman. I'm a partner in Hush Blackwell's Milwaukee office, and I currently serve as the chair of the firm's labor and employment practice group. I am proud to be part of today's presentation regarding workplace diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm excited to introduce my colleagues who are part of our workplace DEI team. Before I begin, though, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. If you've joined us for some Hush Blackwell webinars before, you can tune out. This is something that you've heard before. Um, but for those who are new today, I want to make sure that you're aware of what you have there on the screen that you see. At the bottom of the audience console that you've got are a couple different application icons that you can use during the program today. If you have questions during the webcast, there's a question box there that you can submit, uh, you can use to submit those. Um, we will try to monitor those as we go through our presentation today and to the extent that we're able to um, uh, do two things at once, we'll try to answer those while we're going along. Um, if we're not able to get it, we will get a report at the end of our presentation uh, and can follow up with you to answer questions that might pop up there. A PDF of this presentation that we've put together today is available in the uh, folder that you've got on your uh, desktop there that says program materials. Um, this program has been approved for HR and legal education hours. For live uh, attendees, you can report your hours by clicking on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. And then a certificate of attendance that includes the course numbers will be emailed to you tomorrow along with the recording of this webcast uh, that you can use for watching and sharing. Towards the end of the program, um, uh, I'm gonna ask that you complete uh, a survey that we've got there. We use the feedback that you provide to help plan future programs that are applicable to your business needs. So that's it for house housekeeping. Let's get started uh, with the program. Employers in all industries have increasingly begun to focus on the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace as an essential component of fostering a thriving company culture. What we've observed, however, is that many businesses face challenges in making that move from developing DE&I plans and programs to actually implementing those. So that's the exact reason why we at Hush Blackwell have created our workplace DE&I subgroup. And today we hope to outline for you the various ways that we assist our clients in moving those ideas from ideas into action. We're gonna cover four big picture topics over the next hour. First, we're gonna discuss ways your business can and should go above and beyond basic anti-discrimination and anti-harassment training and share information about some of the business reasons that we believe it makes sense to do that. Second, we'll cover examples of some of the audits and needs assessments that many of our clients are exploring and developing right now and help you understand why we think those tools are important and can be very helpful. Third, we'll talk about the concept of employee resource groups or ERGs, explain how those ERGs are different from affinity groups and share some successful strategies that we've observed in developing and implementing those groups. Then finally, we'll share some additional data and information that we find to be helpful to help clients understand the business imperatives and the business reasons for workplace DEI. And then we'll close out with a discussion about how you can develop effective internal and external DEI communication strategies. So joining me today, I've got colleagues from around the country, including Kayla Loveless, Betsida Zudi, Singleton McAllister, Elizabeth Samples, Katerina Cologne, and Laura Malligade. I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves as we get to their specific topics today. But to start, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues, Kayla and Betsida. Please take it away. Thank you, Eric. Hi, everyone. My name is Kayla Loveless, and I'm joined by my colleague, Beth Zaudi. Beth and I are Labor and Employment Associates at Hush Blackwell, we are also members of the Workplace DEI Practice Group. Today, Beth and I will discuss the importance of implementing effective DEI training within the workplace with an emphasis on the elements of what actually constitutes effective training. Throughout our presentation, we will discuss the bottom line, the current state of DEI programs, the do's and the don'ts of effective diversity training programs, the legal landscape, and we will end our discussion with the bottom line again. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to Beth, and she will discuss the bottom line of DEI training. Thank you, Kayla. 
Um, my presentation will focus on why the current models of the DEI efforts are simply not changing an organization's liability rate, and then address how organizations can optimize DEI programs to mitigate risk. So the bottom line is that the impact of a diverse workplace is clear. Studies have shown that diverse companies and teams outperform their non-diverse counterparts across various metrics. And this is what the research tells us. Diverse companies are 70% more likely to capture new markets. Racially and ethnically diverse companies are 35% more likely to perform better financially than non-diverse companies. And diverse management has been shown to increase revenue by 19%. Studies have also shown that diversity in business leads to greater employee engagement and well-being. We also know that diverse companies are more successful at retaining and recruiting talent, which is consistent with studies that show that seven out of 10 <clears throat> job seekers consider workplace diversity as an important factor when addressing employment opportunities. And judges also look more favorably at companies that have a diversity training program. So while the business case for diversity is clear, effective DEI training is still lacking. For nearly 20 years, companies have spent around $8 billion annually on DEI initiatives, and this figure is projected to reach 15 billion by 2026. And over 60% of companies report having some type of DEI training. However, 75% of corporate diversity programs struggle to achieve measurable results seven out of 10 employees report feeling that their workplace does not foster an inclusive environment. Half of diverse employees report that bias is a part of their daily work experience. And in some cases, DNI training has actually resulted in reduced diversity. So in spite of the investment and the increases in DNI programs, the results demonstrate that some DEI programs are not only ineffective, but that these efforts are simply not improving an organization's liability rate as would be expected. So take, for example, the discrimination charge rate report from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. The good news, as you can see from the first table, is that the rate of discrimination charges have decreased by 26% since 2016. However, as you can see in the second table, the cost of defending workplace discrimination has increased by 25% during that same time. So collectively, this tells us that dis discrimination is more costly today, increased spending is not leading to better outcomes, and the existence of DNI programs and training is simply not enough to mitigate the risk for employers. So while the graphics here capture costs that are easy to identify, the indirect costs are arguably even more detrimental and in some cases difficult to quantify. So these include decreased productivity as well as reputational harm. And at least one study published by the Harvard Business School concluded that toxic employees, which also include top performers who are terminated for violating company policies, are not only more costly to an organization, but that avoiding or replacing them can save an organization more than twice as much as the increased output generated by a top performer. So at least in some cases, the cost of discrimination cannot just be assessed by looking at the charges filed or the litigation costs, but also includes the retention of problematic employees and the effect that such an employee can have on the organization as a whole. So I would like to emphasize that DNI trainings can be effective for reducing individual biases, but the research demonstrates that certain models are simply ineffective and worse, counterproductive. So mandatory trainings can cause pushback and lack of engagement. And at least one study found that organizations that implemented mandatory diversity trainings had fewer diverse employees in management after five years. The one size fits all approach is also ineffective Training should reflect the nuances of a particular company and industry to have maximum impact. Inadequate training, which can also include infrequent trainings, unqualified trainers, or trainings that alienate or target employees are also ineffective. So in order to have maximum impact and mitigate risk, 
Training needs to be tailored to an organization's needs and training should be backed by policies and accountability measures. Kayla will now discuss some core elements of effective DNI training. Thanks, Beth. So far, we've discussed what doesn't work with DNI training, and here are some things that actually do work for effective DNI training. So first, employers should gather data. Employees are the best source of information for determining what's missing within the workplace. This can be done by conducting assessments, conducting surveys, or even implementing focus groups within the workplace. Next, employers should set measurable goals. To be effective, a training program must set realistic goals that actually can be measured. Surprisingly, only about 60% of companies actually have metrics in place to measure the success of DEI programs. So once an employer has gathered the data and set their measurable goals, the next step is actually to train. Training employees and training individuals at the management level and other people who act on behalf of the company is essential to successful DEI training. Last, the employees should measure their progress. And this goes all the way back to the goal or the purpose of the DEI training. So once a problem is actually identified and the employer knows what issue needs to be addressed, measuring progress can actually shine light on whether or not a program is actually effective. And if a program is found to not be effective, then employers should do the process all over again. Effective DEI training is not a quick fix, and it may require multiple efforts by the employer to actually see the changes that the employer desires. So now that we've discussed the do's and the don'ts of effective DNI training, here are some things that we want to highlight about effective DNI training. So periodic trainings that build on each other are more effective than one-off trainings. Next, training that encourages exchanging perspectives and also learning concrete skills or actions is more effective. Last, training should reflect the nuances of the particular company and the industry. So now I'm going to briefly discuss some legal considerations and laws that impact employment and are relevant to DNI training. And so, as we all know, employers must navigate many distinct and overlapping laws when it comes to non-discrimination of employees. And some actions taken with the best intentions can actually be seen as illegal under many of these laws. And so, on the screen, we have a list of some laws, but I won't talk about all of them. And this list is not exhaustive. But one of the main laws that comes to place within this space is Title VII. Title VII prohibits employers from discriminating against and engaging in other adverse conduct towards employees on the basis of protected characteristics like race or color or national origin, religion, and sex. And typically states have a state equivalent to Title VII and these state laws typically offer broader protections to employees. So here we have some data from the EEOC and it reflects the number of charges that were filed with the commission in 2020. And as you can see from the chart, the majority of the charges filed were retaliation based in 2020. In fact, according to the EEOC, about 75% of harassment, harassment cases experienced retaliation after they are reported. And based on the chart, the following three categories with the most amount of charges filed in 2020 were disability, race, and sex. And so this information is relevant as it relates to DEI training because the goal of DEI training is to intervene before problems arise and also to guide employer responses when allegations are actually reported. So finally, I'm going to discuss the legal landscape across the country as it relates to DEI training. So several states have considered an anti diversity training bill in the past year. However, at this time, Florida is the only state that actually has a law. It'll be effective on July 1st, 2022. And that law impacts DEI training at private companies and at educational institutions. Oklahoma, Iowa, Arkansas, and Montana all have laws that actually impact training for government entities and public schools. And most of the language of these laws all mirror each other. So now I'm going to go into a scenario that is intended to basically test your knowledge of the things that we've discussed here. So in this scenario, we have a company that has employees do a privilege walk to foster conversation about the live experiences among employees. Employees start standing in a line and step forward or backward, depending on their answers to a series of questions. The questions are as follows. If you would never think twice about calling the police when trouble occurs, take one step forward. 
If you have been a victim of sexual harassment, take one step back. If you can show affection for your romantic, romantic partner in public without fear of ridicule or violence, take one step forward. At the end of the list of questions, all of the employees look around and the leader of the exercise asks everyone how it felt to be in the front, the middle, or the back of the room. Employees then engage in a discussion of the identities and privileges they have and what they want others to know. Things get a little heated and some employees feel singled out and believe that the exercise did not account for the challenges in their lives. At this time, I'm gonna turn things back over to Besida and she's gonna discuss some questions about the scenario. Thank you, Kayla. So question is, do the disgruntled employees have a claim against the company? Yes in Florida, yes in any state or no? So if you said yes in Florida and no, then you are correct. This is an example of a training that would likely not be permitted under the new Florida law. And although it may not raise, um, give a rise to claim in, in any other state, this is simply just not the best practice training. This type of exercise does not encourage prospective training, it alienates or targets employees, and it also puts marginalized people on the spot to share their experiences. So in conclusion, diversity is just good business. But in order to have maximum impact and mitigate risk, training should be tailored to have or tailored to an organization's needs, and training should be backed by policies and accountability measures. So for the next part of our program, my colleagues will be discussing the importance of conducting audits and needs assessments. Thank you. Betsida, I'm gonna jump in here. Thank you so much for that. And wanted to just highlight one of the questions that we have in our chat, which was a question about how do we measure the effectiveness of DE&I training. And I promise that was not a plant because as you described, we're gonna be moving now to Singleton and Elizabeth talking a bit about the different kinds of audits and needs assessments. Um, I think that will go a long way towards addressing that question. Thank you very much. I'm Singleton McAllister. I'm delighted to be here with you today. And I'm joined with, with uh, Elizabeth Samplett, who's my colleague. And we will, in fact, be talking about conducting audits and needs assessment. Now, my earlier colleagues talk about, uh, talked about the need for diversity and how to move forward in that regard. But we're going to start off here by talking about prioritizing D&I benefits with regard to your stakeholders, employees, and your consumers. And as we can see from the first slide there, we're talking about, and I saw from the list earlier uh, today, that we have many, many uh, representatives from corporations and institutions. And as we all know from our shareholders and our stakeholders, that ESG has become very much top of game. And I know that you've been probably inundated uh, in many ways with proxy statements and board meetings and dealing with your, your clients and your, your colleagues as well. And as we talk about ESG, this is something that has been relatively new. It was started and coined back in 2005 by a Harvard study. And since then, there's been more than $70 trillion in investment in that regard. And within ESG, as we know, we're talking about environment, social, and governance. And in that regard, DE&I fits in that larger ESG scheme. Having said that, um, the metrics to look at ESG also have some impact on what happens with regard to um, DE and I as well. As a matter of fact, a recent study by CNBC sourced that 80% of employees say that they want to work in a place uh, and a company that uh, values DE and I. 77% of the consumers are motivated to purchase from companies committed to making the world a better place. 66% of companies with diversity on senior leadership have experienced a return on capital investment um, in that regard. And 70% of companies skilled at in diversity inclusion are more likely to capture a new market. As we all know, living during these COVID times, our employees and our folks that we work with and our colleagues are just so, so important. We realize in many ways it's a very 
tight and competitive uh, job market. So as a result, those folks want to work in a place where they feel valued and respected. And having said that, um, we have on this particular slide, diversity and inclusion is the right thing to do. We want to foster a collaborative environment. And we also, as lawyers, recognize and HR representatives, we want to avoid liability. My early colleagues talked about areas of law, how we move forward in that direction as well. So having said that stage, what do we do with companies that are interested in audits and needs assessment? Can someone for my next, oh, there it is. I was looking at my little area for my next slide. Thanks so much. So as we talk about uh, DE&I and auditing uh, of late, um, there are a lot of law firms, a lot of uh, organizations, boutiques that do DE&I and I auditing that you may work with. Uh, working with a law firm, as you, as you all know, you do get that attorney-client privilege in many regards. Now, when you say auditing, what does that mean? Actually, that is the first step to figure out where are you in this journey on what we call DE&I and, and, and the diversity space. So first you have to establish the big picture landscape in DE&I efforts. What's your corporation? What does your institution do in that regard? So to have to, to even know that, you have to cap capture your data and organize it in a way where it's useful. Look at a, at a holistic approach to gather both quantitative and qualitative data points. And in that regard, you want to be able to identify uh, employee surveys, uh, look at if you have affinity groups, what are they saying? You want to capture everything you can in an audit to find out where you are and reflect, and, and reflect that diversity journey. You want to do a comprehensive ass assessment of your company and your organization with your DNI efforts. You want to look at your workforce and your management representation, your inclusion, your professional and career development programs, your employer resource groups, your, client, your uh, supplier and vendor demographics, look at your discrimination, look at your harassment, look at your retaliation vulnerabilities. As people leave, you want to do exit interviews. Well, do they feel inclusive? Are they leaving to, you know, for reasons that are outside of not feeling wanted and embraced in the diversity space? And you also want to work very closely with your HR representatives and looking at your policies and practices as well as, as I mentioned earlier, look at workforce employee engagement, including surveys. You'd be surprised how much information you get in that regard. So as you put together this comprehensive data ana analysis of your employee practices, such as hiring, pay, promotion, volunteer separation, discharge dis uh, discipline, performance management, then that is basically your first step in an audit to be able to gather that information and see where you are in the diversity journey. And having gathered that information, that will allow you to be able to capture uh, a snapshot as to where the company is. So Elizabeth, you're gonna take it away after we gather that information and the needs assessment. I will, thank you, Singleton. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Samples and I'm a partner in the firm's education group. Um, so very happy to be here with all of you and, and happy to see many of our education clients uh, joining today. Um, one, one of the reasons that I, I'm proud to be a part of this age group, HB group uh, for various reasons, um, but one of them is also, you know, especially our ability to support our clients with various DE&I needs, you know, recognizing that depending on your entity, um, we have, you know, various practice areas to support you. So. Um, you know, whether it be an educational institution or a corporation, um, you know, really happy to be a part of this, this group and support you all in these efforts. Um, so as it relates to needs assessment, so, you know, once an entity has completed uh, an audit, the needs assessment is about identifying strengths and weaknesses and prioritizing issues, um, you know, that were identified. So it's essentially the why and the how or, you know, the action plan and the work that you'll put in to establish what will be prioritized and why. Um, it helps to, uh, what, what the needs assessment does, it, it helps to tackle a commitment to these issues in a focused way. Um, so sometimes with, with DE&I issues, it can be uh, viewed too narrowly, uh, you know, only about hiring certain candidates or taking an annual training or at other times it can be viewed as incredibly broadly, 
Um, that is, it, this touches everything we do, you know, as an entity, which can, of course, be overwhelming. Um, so both the audit and the needs assessment, you know, can help make that work more manageable um, and facilitate efforts to create a plan that can be followed and, and monitored. So in terms of helping to identify the why, um, the, the audit, you know, will gather information about what you're doing well and what those areas of improvement may be. Um, and it is important to, when you're conducting the needs assessment, you know, also consider the strengths that have been identified. Um, so for example, um, we're gonna turn it over to Katarina here shortly, and she's gonna talk about employee resource groups. Perhaps in the audit, you get feedback from your employees or your community members um, that employee resource groups or other campus student groups are working well and, and making your, your people feel supported. That's an opportunity to leverage that strength um, and make sure that you continue it or maybe add to it and make sure there's communications about it. So it is important to also, you know, make sure that, that this audit, your, your needs assessment team is also looking at those strengths. Um, but, you know, there will likely be areas that are identified um, as, as areas of improvement. Um, so what the needs assessment group is doing is then identifying, okay, once that area has been, uh, you know, identified as, as lacking, what are we going to do about that? What resources do we have? So for example, if, if training um, is identified as an area of need, um, then what for what groups? You know, does it need to be for all of our employees, for all of our you know, campus community members? Is it just for managers? Is it in a certain college? Where is that training, where does that training need to be targeted? And then once that's identified, do we have the capacity or expertise to provide that in-house or um, do we need to you know, hire an external trainer? It's really kind of the nuts and bolts action plan that the, the team is sort of looking at developing. Um, it may require some additional research. You know, hopefully the, the audit report will give you and the needs assessment team you know, all of the data that they need, but there may, you know, that, that needs assessment team may also determine that we need to conduct some additional interviews in a targeted way, or we need to look at a particular area like our HR complaints and gather some more information to sort of uh, better inform this action plan. It may also include benchmarking. So looking at particular categories and comparing to industry leaders um, or other peer institutions um, to determine what the goals you know, will be for improvement. Um, so essentially it's you know, developing a plan for you know, where we are and where we want to be, which of course will vary um, you know, depending on you know, your organization. Um, and, and one of the things that was focused on in that you know, excellent first section related to um, you know, being reactive versus proactive, you, know, you, you could potentially you know, obviously need to go straight to addressing um, something you know, that was raised in a, in a complaint um, or a particular incident. Um, but obviously that's you know, responsive rather than proactive. And so the audit ensures that you're, you're capturing a broad range of information um, and, and not just related to a particular incident or a you know, particular community member, but getting that broad range of information and then determining priorities uh, from there. Um, and then one last thing on the needs assessment, um, it's important, I think, to you know, consider who is at the table when making the determinations um, and, and going through these needs assessments. So of course, um, again, as we think about the diversity of our clients that are on the call right now, that really very much depends on your organization and, and where you are in this journey, as Singleton said, and, and who is in place to support your DE&I work. So maybe you have a dedicated chief diversity officer and a team who um, can develop this strategy. Maybe you have a working group um, and it's an important component of their work, but it's not the only hat they're wearing, um, but they're committed to it and they're, they're sort of involved in, in doing this needs assessment work. Or maybe it's, it's your, your HR uh, team. Um, you know, at, at, the, at a higher ed, ed example, um, you know, maybe you have a, a chief diversity officer. Maybe you also have dedicated individuals at various colleges throughout your university who are also focused on this work. So um, making sure that you're sort of including um, who needs to be included um, and, and making sure that it's those individuals who have the ability um, to review the, the audit and determine the plan um, and, and influence you know, the organization. Um, 
So it doesn't have to be a, a CDO and a dedicated team. Again, it'll vary by organization. It, it needs to also be a group though that understands um, how this needs assessment and the action plan can be developed um, to be aligned with uh, leadership and the overall business objectives or you know campus objectives from from leadership so so that there's alignment um, so being aware of those overall objectives um, and being in communication with with entity leadership is is certainly an important uh, component of this um, so then we'll move to a few um, action items. So again, the ultimate goal um, of, of the audit and needs assessment um, is to ensure that we've got the data to help clarify our goals uh, related to DEI and make that action plan. Um, so when when educating the when educating and communicating with your organization, you can use the audit and the needs assessment to explain the why. You know why are certain areas being targeted. So, um, for example, this needs assessment team is going through the audit and considering the resources that are available and what needs to be prioritized. So then when, when your entity is communicating, you know, with your, your people, you're saying we're targeting the following one or two things now, um, for example, an education plan or establishment of an employee resource group, and, and we conducted an audit, and that tells us why, you know, we're starting there. Um, so it, it, it allows you to sort of communicate that you are, you know, really seeking to be intentional about this and be informed about um, where the needs are and where the opportunities are and, and why, you know, you're moving forward in the way that you are, uh, which of course helps to garner support, um, you know, for, for the actions that you're engaging in. In, in terms of educating the organization, um, Educating employees and students may well be a clear priority that comes from the audit and the needs assessment, um, like again, the trainings that we heard about. Um, and, and employee interviews and responses uh, are especially likely to reveal information about the E and the I of the DEI, equity and inclusion. Um, so, for example, you may get feedback about you know, concerns related to applications of, of certain policies. Um, and so then with, with respect to that, you're maybe considering from, from the needs assessment standpoint, um, uh, redeveloping uh, certain policies related to perhaps dress code or pay equity or promotion practices. Um, of course, with any sort of policy redevelopment, um, there are issues with compliance, um, designated, you know, whether you have the correct designated employees uh, in place to receive um, certain types of complaints and whether you have the procedures that are legally required. Um, and so that will, you know, is an area that will require, you know, certainly review and, and vetting. Um, and there's also important evaluation with respect to policies and procedures um, about whether they're workable. Um, you know, do we have the right trained individuals uh, in place? Um, and Singleton talked about, you know, the, the benefit of, of uh, this work, you know, being privileged, um, especially of digging into statistical data, you know, which may uh, reveal, um, uh, you know, issues uh, related to disparate treatment, you know, whether it's pay or uh, pay or promotion, um, it, that privilege can give some, you know, protection to, to the information that's, that's uh, found. Um, and then again, just taking care with communications and how uh, information about these commitments are communicated to um, your organization. Number one, of course, ensuring that it is something that um, the, the organization is committed to carrying out. Um, it, it, these, these types of activities can help to reduce risk um, because it can demonstrate that the, the company or the institution's actions are tied to a specific need or an issue. Um, you know, and, and informed, but of course there could also be legal implications for adopting new policies or um, creating um, new hiring practices. And so um, those things should be, you know, carefully vetted. Um, and then finally, you know, there may be um, information that's revealed during um, the audit that, that translates to the needs assessment about recruiting future employees, which um, obviously could be its own, uh, you know, webinar in itself. Um, but just um, to the extent that, you know, your, um, your audit is revealing information about the D of the DEI, the demographic information, statistical information about who your employees are and um, who your leaders are, um, there may be you know, considerations that follow from that um, that your needs assessments team is sort of um, working through. 
Um, so um, with that, um, and, and, and one thing I was gonna say related to recruiting uh, materials, thinking of them as um, company advertisements, um, you know, to the way that, that the entity is doing things well. Um, for example, uh, maybe there are em employee resource groups that you want to highlight in sort of recruiting materials. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Katerina, um, who's going to discuss ERGs. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. And thank you, Singleton, too. Very informative. Um, my name is Katerina Cologne, and I am a labor and employment attorney in Hush Blackwell's Milwaukee office. I work with many of our education clients as well, and am a member of our DEI workplace practice group. I am also the chair of Hush Blackwell's internal Latino and Hispanic employee resource group. So today I'm gonna to discuss a topic that is obviously very near and dear to me, which is the creation and implementation of employee resource groups and or affinity groups. So ERGs found their beginning as the result of the civil rights movement in the 1960s in the United States. So they're not new, but they've recently taken on new roles within our workplaces as employers focus on building more inclusive cultures and look for ways to improve employee retention rates. And to give you a definition, ERGs are employer recognized workplace groups voluntarily led by employees that allow employees with shared interests, interests experiences and hobbies to meet, to support each other, um, to help improve the business and increase job satisfaction. And the key here is that in order for an ERG to be effective, it must align with your organization's mission. And I'm gonna discuss that more in a little bit. ERGs promote diversity and inclusion efforts by allowing employees to network with other individuals within your organization, um, which often results in informal mentorship pairings um, and can lead to creating pipelines to leadership roles for those who have been historically underrepresented within your organization. Um, ERGs have historically been focused on race or sex. However, they are expanding to encompass other definitions um, and dimensions of diversity, such as veteran status, neurodiversity, uh, mental and physical health advocacy groups, and LGBTQIA plus status. And Katerina, let me just interject there. I wanna give you a shout out. Katerina just had a really interesting post on um, uh, considerations for employers to take, to take into account regarding employees who may be neurodivergent. And that was one of the first pieces that I've seen written on that topic. So an interesting area that I think Katerina has some specific uh, thoughts and expertise in. Yeah, thanks so much, Eric. And I would encourage you all to, to look at that because I think it is an untapped um, pool of applicants and prospective employees. Um, uh, many people who are neurodivergent uh, possess very unique characteristics that make them excellent employees. So thanks for the shout out, Eric. So now that we know what ERGs are, how do we create these groups within our workplaces? Um, well, most of the time they tend to form organically, but they can also be created by organizations as well. Um, as your company is considering which are ERGs it will have, you're gonna want to understand which groups in your organization are currently underrepresented. Um, because ERGs are seen as a retention and morale boosting tool, the focus tends to be on retaining those employees that are underrepresented within your industry because these groups help to spell isolation and increase employee engagement. Uh, it's okay to start small and let the ERG membership grow organically. Um, and that can come through word of mouth or company advertising. Um, this is something I've experienced firsthand. Our internal uh, employee resource group for Latinos and Hispanics at Hush Blackwell started off as five of us, and now there are 40 of us. And that really occurred by, um, by word of mouth and through the firm supporting our ERG. And so your companies can certainly do the same. So it's okay if they start off small because they tend to kind of snowball after that. Once the ERGs are created, um, you'll want to appoint or work closely with an executive sponsor. And so this individual's tasked with leveraging their influence in senior leadership to push DEI initiatives and engage more senior leadership in these conversations. And it's important to note that they don't necessarily need to be from the same demographic as the ERG. Um, it really just depends on the demographics of your, of your senior leadership. 
Um, again, one of the ERG's purposes is to align with and improve the functions of the business. So you're also going to want the ERG's to create their own charter and goals, um, which will outline the purpose and function of each ERG. Um, for example, some goals might include uh, gaining member visibility by doing member spotlights company wide. They can help with talent recruitment, community outreach, and they can assist with reviewing uh, onboarding and orientation materials for equity policies and practice specific to their demographic. So anytime you implement an initiative that may feel exclusionary, there is some risk of an employee bringing about concerns of discrimination. And one practice to avoid this is to allow memberships in these groups, even if the employee's identities do not align with the group that it has been created to support. So if the group is open to all, it's very hard to argue that you are being exclusionary. Um, it's also important to note that claims of reverse discrimination, which refer to discriminatory conduct or behavior um, that's directed against members of a historically dominant or majority group are largely unsuccessful and courts have noted that it must be the unusual employer who discriminates against the majority. So those, those cases tend not to prevail. Uh, nevertheless, it's important to exercise forethought when you're implementing ERGs. And at the end of the day, communication is key. If, if an employee comes to you with concerns of discriminatory practices, you should address it as you would any other similar concern. Um, and if you decide to prohibit one class of ERG, you're gonna wanna make sure you're consistent. So an example would be if you ban uh, the formation of a Christian ERG, you should also ban any other religion focused ERG as well. Now moving on to affinity groups. So ERGs and affinity groups are often referred to interchangeably. However, uh, there are some key differences. They're, they're similar in that they're created based on the group's common interests or goals, but they're different in that there's little to no leadership involvement in affinity groups. Um, and the group does not necessarily have any formalized goals. So we like to think of affinity groups as more of like a social club. So some examples might include employees who share like a love of cycling or reading or theater. Um, our recommendation is that employers encourage the formation of ERGs as opposed to affinity groups, simply because ERGs align more closely with business goals, um, but they still encourage networking and mentorship and fostering inclusive spaces. Now I've already discussed many of the benefits of these groups, but we have included a nice slide here kind of summarizing them for you. Uh, these groups can help with recruitment and retention, like I mentioned. Um, you can improve your branding and marketing, marketing strategies. Um, they can assist with training, mentorship, and creating pipelines to leadership roles. Uh, they can also expand your market reach and business development, improve employee morale and innovation through ERG meetings and think tanks. So some very, very obvious benefits to encouraging um, and supporting ERGs within your workforce. And then we just have some best practices here. So make sure they're carefully structured, um, encourage mentorship, encourage sharing, but you can also consider creating an application process and a mission statement requirement to clarify the group's purpose, as we mentioned before. Um, you can consider also providing tasks for the ERGs. So they may have their internal goals, but leadership should feel encouraged to collaborate with the ERGs if there's a specific issue that they're struggling with. Like, why are we having so much trouble recruiting from this demographic? Or what can we do to be more appealing to this demographic of candidates? Um, as I mentioned, limits on group creation must be applied equally to all. Um, and you're gonna wanna task a management representative or that ex executive sponsor to be and act as a liaison between your affinity members and your company leaders. And now I am going to pass things on to my colleagues, Eric Eisenman and Laura Malugate. Thank you, Katerina, really appreciate that. Um, uh, we're gonna start, uh, Laura and I are gonna start by talking about uh, making the business case for DE&I and then uh, sort of conclude our presentation today uh, talking about making an, and developing an effective DE&I communication strategy. Um, but I'll have Laura start. Um, you've heard this sort of throughout uh, the presentation, but I think she'll talk specifically about some of the key ways to the extent that you are 
uh, advocating inside your organization uh, about how to make the business case for workplace DE&I. Laura. Thanks, Eric, um, <clears throat> and thanks to all of you for joining us today. It's really great to be here talking about such important topics. Um, my name is Laura Malugate. I'm based out of the firm's Milwaukee office. I'm a labor and employment attorney on the team here, and I'm also a member of the firm's DEI subgroup as well. So, <clears throat> like Eric mentioned, we've you know touched on this topic already, but we really wanted to drive home the point that the overwhelming amount of evidence and research and data confirms that a company that invests in DE&I is investing in its bottom line. <clears throat> so this is more than just being the right thing to do, which of course it is, um, but it actually results in tangible economic benefits to your company. When um, companies commit themselves to DE&I, they're better able to track, attract and retain top talent they improve employee engagement and satisfaction, and they're more customer oriented, which I'll touch on in a little bit here. But, you know, not only as, you know, Beth mentioned earlier, not only is our workforce demanding it here, um, but when we really focus on DEI, particularly the I in that, the inclusion component, um, <clears throat> which helps foster a sense of belonging and value that employees have, it's been shown to reduce employee turnover significantly by approximately 50%. And you know, we all know that there's such a huge cost to employee turnover and how much value there is in retaining that top talent. So you know, diverse and inclusive organizations have been shown to earn the trust and commitment from their employees that also increases their engagement in job performance um, as much as 56%. Um, data also shows that millennials are up to 83% more engaged when their organization is prioritizing DEI. And conversely, um, when people feel like their ideas and contributions and the things that are important to them, um, which we know DEI is important to so many people, when they feel like those aren't valued, or taken seriously, that's when they leave. The well-known um, think tank McKinsey and Company has published a few um, really excellent reports on the business case for diversity and inclusion. And I encourage you all to review that. Um, but you know, at a high level, the reports and data confirm that diverse companies outperform non-diverse companies in terms of profitability and innovation. So, you know, for example, gender diverse executive teams are up to 21% more likely to outperform their counterparts in terms of profitability. And teams where we see higher levels of racial diversity, they see up to 15 times the sales revenue of their counterparts. Those are significant differences um, that can't and shouldn't be ignored. And, you know, really regardless of the industry that you're in, your customers and your clients, your target audience includes a mix of races, religions, sexual orientations, gender identities, and all other characteristics. So when your workforce includes a mix of these differences as well, your company is gonna be better suited to understand and respond to your target audience's needs. Also, employees from diverse backgrounds and life experiences contribute different ideas and perspectives they bring to the table that others may not have. And that's been shown and demonstrated, again with data, to lead to better problem solving processes and a more innovative environment. So, you know, one of the great things about all of this data that we have that's available to us is that it can and really should be tailored to your specific workplace needs. So, you know, the first step in, you know, how do we build this case for um, DE&I is to know and understand your company's specific needs and goals in this space. So, you know, what are your employees saying about your workplace? What issues are the most pressing to you? This kind of relates back to that, you know, DEI audit and um, needs assessment that Singleton and Elizabeth talked about. You know, if turnover is really a big issue in your organization, then you can position DEI as a talent retention program, and you have plenty of data to back you up with that. Um, if you need to grow your headcount, uh, you can reach into new talent pools by expanding your DEI efforts. 
Um, is employee morale an issue? Focus on the data related to employee engagement that's out there. If the decision makers and key stakeholders are really only gonna focus on the bottom line, then focus on the revenue generating advantages that have been proven through having a robust DEI program. So kind of on a similar note there, when you're gathering the facts, like the ones um, referenced on those previous two slides, focus specifically on the concrete numbers that your business is struggling with. So whether that's recruiting, retention, sales, brand, image, like I said, morale or innovation, you can really drill down on the return on investment, which allows you to transition from sharing anecdotes and stories, which are also very important in their own right, but to really bring in that data-driven element and insights that can help you paint a more holistic and compelling picture for your key stakeholders. Um, and you know, ultimately, when the plan in place is relevant and it's connected to your company's short and long-term goals, it's going to add legitimacy, you know, to the pitch that you're making, and it shows that your proposal with respect to DEI efforts is inherently intertwined with your business's growth and development. Then, of course, you want to be sure to include tangible examples um, in your proposal to that you can use to leverage and explain where to go from here. And that can include any number of the things that we've already heard about today. So, you know, we can start with that DEI audit that Singleton mentioned and the needs assessment. And, you know, think about the ERGs that Katarina talked about. Training, of course, is always important. I think really focusing on that unconscious bias and inclusion training is really um, critical. Uh, updating policies and procedures, um, and even creating, you know, a DEI communication strategy, um, which I will actually pass it off to Eric um, to talk about uh, as our next topic, is another thing to consider as well. Thank you, Laura. What a, what a what a smooth transition. Um, this this is a this is actually a good place to hit a couple of questions that we have in the queue here that I think are really relevant. There was one which I thought was interesting. Do you have advice for a business that is rooted in a particular religious tradition that might pu push back against inclusion for certain groups? That is a thorny question, and and I'm not sure that we have a silver bullet for that. But I think a piece of that is some of the stuff that Laura has just described here. Is to the extent that you are an advocate inside your organization for the importance of developing and implementing these kind of programs and training. You know, focusing on the business case, the bottom line, the reasons to do this above and beyond whatever you think about this as sort of a moral and ethical imperative, you know, is we found to be helpful and successful to allow businesses to move forward with this. So, you know, focusing on the fact in which it benefits the business as an ongoing concern or the educational institution um, you know, that, that can potentially help overcome some of the pushback that might come in different forms. We had a couple of folks ask uh, for additional information about those resources that Laura was mentioning. She mentioned specifically uh, a paper by McKinsey, the consulting company and think tank. There's another resource that we've used heavily, which are um, some reports by Deloitte, which has a DEI consulting arm. Um, what I think we will do is we will put some links to that information in addition to our presentation today on um, our webpage. You can find this group that you've heard from today on the Hush Blackwell. We have a sub subgroup on the Hush Blackwell webpage. The easiest way may be to just Google workplace DEI Hush Blackwell, uh, but there will also be links to that um, in the materials that we'll send out. Again, um, we'll include that, but something that we found is useful for our clients is helping them put meat on the bones of these issues when they're making those cases internally. So Laura mentioned um, the last piece here, uh, which is especially important and frankly resonates with me uh, uh, because we've been dealing with a related issue this week. And that's the importance of having a DE&I communication strategy. Um, you know, it's all well and good to do all of the hard work that we've talked about today, uh, but it's equally important to be able to have a communication strategy that allows you to communicate that work and those efforts that you're doing both internally and externally. So why does it make sense to have a strategy on this topic? This is fairly self-evident, but one of the reasons is that it's important to have a cohesive mes message. You don't want to simply invest in external communications and not be communicating those same values or importance 
internally as well and have your employees believe, okay, well, this is just window dressing and they're not really committed to it. So one reason is cohesion. Sharing the company's culture and showing progress towards those DE&I goals, that's getting benefit from the hard work that you're doing and also you know, creating that sort of outreach that allows you to retain the talent that you have and recruit that talent out there in the world that folks on, on the group here have talked about um, you know, is important and are especially sensitive and interested in businesses that are committed to these issues. Attracting that talent and becoming an employer of choice and then that last bullet point, welcoming diverse customers. You know, we've heard a couple times today about, you know, the fact that diverse businesses, you know, are, are reaching customers or reaching consumers, however those are defined, in, in a way that is head and shoulders above uh, their competitors. So I mentioned that there's kind of two components here, an internal strategy and an external strategy. Let's start with things that, that we can do uh, from an internal standpoint. And these are just some examples of things that this strategy might focus on. One would be, promoting the affinity groups or employee resource groups that Katarina highlighted. Um, you know, to the extent that you have invested time in developing these, you wanna make sure that you are creating a platform for those groups and the members of those groups to be able to share their perspectives so that they can grow in the way that uh, Katarina described our internal groups have grown here at Hush Blackwell. Something that I think is particularly useful and I've kind of liked that we've done here at the firm is, is giving periodic opportunities for members of the various different ERGs to share their own experiences, highlighting those. We've seen some of those this month uh, during Pride Month of some of our LGBTQ employees. Um, uh, you know, During Black History Month and Hispanic History Month, we've had members of those groups sort of featured on our internal pages or messages that have been going around. And I think that that's been helpful for those of us who are not necessarily part of those specific subgroups to understand. And I think it's a nice opportunity for the firm to sort of reemphasize its commitment there. One thing that I'll use here as a case study um, is though you need to, how would I say this? If you're gonna talk the talk, you gotta walk the walk. We've got here as a highlight, an example of a communication that our firm put out internally celebrating Juneteenth as a firm holiday. This is something that we've done um, over the last couple of years has gained addition, additional traction. And I'm pleased that we've seen year over year additional emphasis by leadership here in the firm on the importance of taking this seriously and treating it as a holiday that is observed like any others. There was actually an additional communication separate from the one that you see here that went out to partners in the firm, reminding us that it was important that we treated this as a holiday and not just another work day. And I was pleasantly surprised anecdotally that a number of partners that I worked with took that to heart treated that in the spirit that it was intended. But I can tell you that Hush Blackwell still has some work to do. Um, there are uh, associates, uh, e even some members of this call who were asked uh, or received emails asking for them to perform projects on Juneteenth, notwithstanding the clear and repeated communications from, from firm leadership. So um, it's important to have that communication. It's important to get that message out internally. Um, but if you're anything like our firm, it will take some time to continue to hammer on and get that message through. So simply having the communication is not enough. Actually following through is, is important because otherwise, um, you know, employees may see that as simply just window dressing, as I mentioned. External, very similar to what you would be doing internally. You know, it's important for you to sort of have a team that is monitoring the news, that is aware of these issues that are occurring. You know, the first time that a lot of us at this firm really became you know, aware of this as, as, as a need for our clients was the summer of 2020 with the murder of George Floyd and clients who wanted to address concerns that were coming up in their workplaces that wanted to speak out on this issue. Um, you know, it, it's important for you to have a team in place and to give these sort of issues foresight and forethought so that you can be proactive rather than reactive. Um, you know, there are lots of consequences to, you know, uh, acting hastily, saying the wrong thing, or even as we've got up here, sometimes saying nothing also communicates a message. So, um, you know, this is something that, that we have helped clients with and that is important from our perspective that you think about to make sure that you're doing the, the, the right work to put yourself into place to respond correctly when those issues happen. So I apologize that we kind of ran through that, that last slide. Um, a lot to cover, but a lot of topics that are um, important for our clients and that we we wanted to share with you today. Um, I'll have just a few sort of closing uh, housekeeping items. We appreciate you joining us today and we hope that it was helpful for you. Um, as I mentioned, the program has been approved for HR and legal education hours and you can report those through the icon that was on the bottom of your screen. 
There's going to be a uh, certificate of attendance um, that will be emailed, and that will include a link to the recording of this presentation. As I mentioned, we will also post it on the Workplace DEI webpage that we have on the Hush Blackwell site, and we'll also try to include some links there to some of those resources that Laura mentioned. And then finally, you'll see that link for the survey. Um, we'd love it if you could uh, complete that so we get your feedback and know what was useful for you and what we can do in the future to continue to improve. Thank you so much to all of our presenters today. Um, uh, one of the most rewarding things um, for me of being a part of this group is to, to listen to these um, amazing uh, colleagues that I've been able to work with, hear their stories. And I think it really sort of um, embodies the point that Laura made earlier about the benefit from having a diverse group. And when we say diversity, we mean from all perspectives, you know, gender, race, background, age, um, experience. So um, we're working on it. I know that uh, our, our attendees here today are working on it as well, uh, but we thank you for spending some time with us and hope that you have a great rest of your day.